on World News Tonight. Joint plan. Russian leader and Chinese president shows off their tight friendship in the Kremlin. Pensioners unrest. Chaos in Paris after the French government survives no confidence vote over pension reforms. Plummeting prices. Oil prices drop to their lowest levels on concerns that a global banking crisis could spark a recession. St. Patrick's Day Parade. The streets of Dublin come to lives as the Irish celebrate St. Patrick's Week. is Ada Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're joining us on World News Tonight. Now we have stories lined up from the new allegations against India to the boiling protests in France. We start with the highly anticipated visit to Moscow by the Chinese president. Vladimir Putin has said that he will discuss Xi Jinping's 12-point plan to settle the acute crisis in Ukraine. Putin said that the Russian Federation is always open for a negotiation process as the leaders called each other a dear friend. President Xi Jinping is currently on a three-day visit to Russia. There, the Chinese leader met with Russian President Vladimir Putin on Monday for what Beijing has billed as peace talks as part of Xi's vision to mediate a deal to end the conflict in Ukraine. During the talks, the two leaders touted their close ties amid geopolitical tensions and their shared strategic vision. Calling him a dear friend, Xi showed continued support for Putin amid international condemnation of the ongoing war in Ukraine and the recent issuing of an arrest warrant for the Russian leader by the International Criminal Court. Washington, however, remains skeptical over what they believe to be China's real intentions. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken went as far as to slam Beijing for siding with Moscow, despite the ICC arrest warrant for Putin for alleged war crimes. That President Xi is traveling to Russia days after the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for President Putin suggests that China feels no responsibility to hold the Kremlin accountable for the atrocities committed in Ukraine and instead of even condemning them, uh, it would rather provide diplomatic cover for Russia to continue to commit those very crimes. Both U.S. and European officials are also concerned that China may even add fuel to the war in Ukraine, with Washington still believing that Beijing is open to supplying Russia with artillery shells. Not to mention, Washington also believes that any ceasefire deal brokered by China may be more beneficial to Russia. But we are concerned that instead, China will reiterate calls for a ceasefire that leaves Russian forces inside Ukraine's sovereign territory. Now, any ceasefire that does not address the removal of Russian forces from Ukraine would effectively ratify Russia's illegal conquests. U.S. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby says she should also consider Ukraine, with the Chinese leader expected to hold phone talks with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky after his visit to Russia. The annual U.S. report on human rights practices were released listing significant human rights issues and abuses in India, including reported targetings of religious minorities, dissidents and journalists. The finding comes nearly a year after Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. was monitoring what he described as a rise in human rights abuses in India by some government, police and prison officials in a rare district rebuke by Washington of the Asian nation's rights record. U.S. criticism of India is rare due to close economic ties between countries and India's increasing importance of Washington to counter China in the region. Significant human rights issues in India have included credible reports of the government or its agents conducting extrajudicial killings, torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment of punishment by police and prison officials, political prisoners or detainees, and unjustified arrests of prosecutions of journalists. Advocacy groups have raised concerns over what they say as a deteriorating human rights situation in India in recent years under the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Human Rights Watch had said that the Indian government's policies and actions target Muslims while critics of Modi say his Hindu nationalist ruling party has fostered religious polarization since coming to power in 2014. The French Parliament adopted a divisive pension bill raising the retirement age in France from 62 to 64 after lawmakers in the lower chamber rejected two no-confidence votes against the government. 
French President Emmanuel Macron's government nearly survived a no-confidence motion in the National Assembly Monday after bypassing the lower house last week to push through an unpopular overhaul to the pension system. The outcome was a relief to Macron. A successful no-confidence vote would have sunk his government and killed the legislation, which is set to raise the retirement age by two years to 64. But the relief could be short-lived. For one thing, the vote was closer than expected. Some 278 MPs voted in favor of the tripartisan no-confidence motion, just nine short of the 287 needed for it to succeed. In addition, unions and protesters have vowed to carry on with the strikes and protests against the pension reform. Macron's government says reform is necessary to keep the pension budget afloat. Some hard-left lawmakers have called on the prime minister to resign. When she addressed lawmakers on Monday, angry MPs walked out in protest. Ce sont des députés. These are lawmakers who are denying their role in parliament and are claiming that the streets are more legitimate than the institutions. After the vote, far-left lawmaker Matilda Panot said the government has already lost its legitimacy. And of course, a prime minister who no longer has legitimacy or power to push through with her reform. (laughs) Violent unrest has erupted across the country in recent days, and trade unions have promised to intensify their strike action. Leaving Macron to face the most dangerous challenge to his authority since the Yellow Vest uprising over four years ago. Opposition parties are also ready to challenge the pension bill in the Constitutional Council, which could decide to strike down some or all of it if it considers the new law to breach the Constitution. Protests erupted across France hours after the government adopted deeply unpopular pension reforms. Adrian Navalny, special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratha, joins us now from Normandy in France to give us the latest details. Chetana, what is the situation like in France? Shanali. Paris is burning, literally. The events unfolding on the streets of Paris are very reminiscent of the events of the French Revolution that shook France in 1789. There's chaos just after hours after the French President Emmanuel Macron's government narrowly survived a non-confidence vote for its plans to raise the retirement age by two years to 64. Protesters, angry about the proposed reforms, set fire to piles of garbage and other debris in the streets with several people being detained and several tear gassed. There were similar scenes in the French cities of Lille and Bordeaux where hundreds of people gathered and chanted Macron resign. Opposition's lawmakers vowed to force a U-turn and unions prepared for national-wide action on Thursday. In some of the central Paris, most prestigious avenues, firefighters scrambled to put out burning rubbish piles left uncollected for days due to strikes as protesters played cat and mouse with the police for a fifth night. What many concerns the executive is the large number of young people in the demonstrations. Pensioners say they are not surprised the vote for no confidence failed, adding that they will continue to fight and the movement will grow. The key question in coming days will be whether Macron uh, sticks with the existing government as he looks to freshen things up even the potential paralysis in the parliament will make governing more complicated. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidhar Nawalny, Special Correspondent Chetan Adharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Workers erected barricades around the Manhattan courthouse as New York City braced for a possible indictment of Donald Trump over an alleged hush money payment to adult star Stormy Daniels during his 2016 campaign. If indicted, it would be the first ever criminal case against any U.S. president. The New York City Police Department began erecting metal fencing in Lower Manhattan on Monday as a potential criminal indictment for Donald Trump appears imminent. Law enforcement officials were stepping up security around the Manhattan courthouse where the charges would be filed after Trump over the weekend called on his supporters to protest. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg is probing alleged hush money payments made by Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, to an adult film star who claimed to have had a sexual affair with the former president, claims Trump denies. 
No current or former president in U.S. history has ever been criminally charged, and Trump is in the midst of yet another campaign for the White House. All signs point to his imminent indictment by a grand jury. Donya Perry is a former assistant U.S. attorney for New York's Southern District. She expects may happen next. But if the indictment seems imminent, the case against Trump is far from certain. Cohen admitted to making the payment to adult performer Stormy Daniels in the waning days of the 2016 presidential campaign and was reimbursed by Trump after he took office, a reimbursement that was falsely billed as, quote, legal fees. Falsifying business records is a misdemeanor, but legal experts say it can be elevated to a felony if it was part of covering up another crime. In this case, prosecutors may allege Trump was trying to hide an illegal campaign contribution. James Sample is a law professor at Hofstra University. What? Federal prosecutors charged Cohen with election law crimes related to the payment. He pleaded guilty, served prison time, and has emerged as a likely key witness in Bragg's investigation. Trump has called the probe a politically motivated witch hunt and claimed without evidence that Democratic President Joe Biden may be directing it. The Manhattan probe is far from the only investigation dogging the Republican candidate. A Georgia prosecutor is looking into Trump's efforts to undermine the 2020 election results in that state. And the U.S. Justice Department has named a special counsel to investigate Trump's illegal retention of classified documents, as well as his involvement in alleged efforts to subvert the 2020 presidential election. If Bragg were to charge the former president, a trial could be more than a year away, which means it could be scheduled to start as the 2024 election is in full swing, or even after the defendant has taken office. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, oil prices rebounded and rose over 1% after diving to their lowest levels in 15 months as the market worried that risks in the global banking sector could spark a recession that would sap fuel demand. Oil prices dropped to their lowest levels in 15 months on Monday on concerns that a global banking crisis could spark a recession that would reduce fuel demand. In volatile trading, Global benchmark Brent crude and U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude each fell about $3 a barrel to their lowest levels since December of 2021. WTI sunk below $65 a barrel before pairing some losses. Brent was trading at around $72 a barrel. Brent hit a 14-year peak of around $130 a barrel a year ago and was one of the main drivers of global inflation. It was above $100 a barrel as recently as July. Crude's Monday slide came despite a historic deal in which UBS, Switzerland's largest bank, agreed to buy Credit Suisse in an attempt to rescue the European country's second biggest bank. After the deal was announced, the U.S. Federal Reserve, European Central Bank, and other major central banks pledged to enhance market liquidity and support other banks. Given the recent turmoil in the banking sector and fears it could trigger a long-feared recession, traders and economists remain split on whether the U.S. Federal Reserve will raise its benchmark rate when policymakers meet this week. Some executives are calling on the central bank to pause its monetary policy tightening for now, but be ready to resume raising rates later. Meanwhile, one oil analyst that the oil market is moving more on fear than fundamentals, saying, quote, we're not moving at all on supply and demand fundamentals. We're just moving on the banking concerns. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced a softening of his hard-right government's judicial overhaul plan. An apparent bid to claim that more than two months of nationwide protests and misgiving voiced by Western allies. Facing mounting mass protests inside of Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday said he would soften his controversial judicial overhaul plan. But the changes failed to satisfy an opposition that has organized a campaign against the government over the proposed reforms. The plan would give the government more control of the appointment of judges and constrain the Supreme Court's ability to check the legislature or the executive. Critics say the proposed overhaul would undermine the Supreme Court as an independent branch of government and erode the nation's democracy. 
Netanyahu's proposed changes, apart from the plan's shakeup in appointing judges, which he wants to see ratified before a parliament recess on April 2nd. Recent changes to that bill would give opposition lawmakers some say in judicial appointments. The prime minister presented these changes as an olive branch to his rivals. In a statement, Netanyahu said he was extending a hand to anyone who genuinely cares about national unity and the desire to reach an agreed accord. Opposition leader Yair Lapid rejected the moves. The moment the change to the Judicial Appointments Committee passes, we will appeal against it at the Supreme Court. The base for the appeal will be simple. If this law passes, Israel stops being a democratic state. We will not allow this to happen. The liberal camp is simply unwilling to live in a non-democratic state. Hundreds of thousands of Israeli patriots will continue to take to the streets. We will continue to fight here at Knesset. We will not allow this to happen. Netanyahu says the changes will balance the branches of government. The Black Flags activist group says demonstrations that have already shaken the country and reached into its normally apolitical military would be intensified. It accused Netanyahu of attempting to put the protest to sleep with pretty words. Netanyahu also faced censure from his government coalition, as at least one lawmaker called his changes capitulation. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol will be heading to Tokyo again in May for the widely expected attendance at the G7 summit, with South Korea having welcomed Japan's invitation to the meeting as another constructive step towards mending bilateral ties, as well as strengthening cooperation in the region. President Yoon suk yeols office has welcomed Japan's invitation for South Korea to join the G7 meeting in May, amid anticipation that the two neighbours will discuss strategic cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. A few hours after Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced on Monday he'd asked eight countries to join the summit in Hiroshima. Seoul's top office spokesperson Lee Dawn said in a written statement Monday this was a positive measure taken as a result of the Yoon Kishida summit last week. Affirming their will to resolve the historical sticking points that triggered the trade war in 2019, the two leaders at their summit last week agreed to take steps to resume and bolster trade and active diplomacy. Critically, they saw eye to eye on strengthening cooperation in the face of various economic and security challenges, with the South Korean president highlighting the two countries' common values of upholding liberal democracy, the rule of law and market economy. Yun told Japanese media before his meeting with Kishida that attending the G7 meeting would provide a chance to establish strong solidarity and cooperation with countries that share universal values, mainly in security, economy and trade. The G7 summit is widely expected to focus on the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine and financial instability across the global economy. Okay. On the sidelines, the leaders of South Korea, Japan and the United States are likely to meet to discuss North Korea's growing nuclear and missile threat, as well as ways to bolster economic security and technological cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. In this regard, Japanese media reported that Canada is eager to form a four-country cooperation framework with Seoul, Tokyo and Washington amid geopolitical frictions with China and Russia. Such an informal framework already exists, comprising the US, Japan, India and Australia, known as the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or QUAD for short. The Japan Times cited diplomatic sources who said Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau proposed a new QUAD to Kushida in January. When questioned about the idea, a South Korean presidential official told reporters they hadn't heard of a new quad so far, but cooperation in military and economic security is highly likely to be discussed during the G7 summit or Yoon's upcoming summit with US President Joe Biden next month. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called on rich nations to accelerate their shift to net zero emissions after a new assessment from scientists warned that there was little time to lose when it came to tackling climate change. The climate time bomb is ticking. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says there's little time to lose in tackling climate change and rich countries need to slash emissions sooner. His latest call came in a recorded address after a new assessment from scientists. Humanity is on thin ice and that ice is melting fast. As today's report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, details, humans are responsible for virtually all global heating over the last 200 years. 
Guterres said the panel's latest synthesis report should be seen as a survival guide for humanity. He urged developed countries to commit to reaching net zero emissions by the earlier date of around 2040. According to the IPCC, emissions must be halved by the mid-2030s if the world is to have any chance of limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That's a key target in the 2015 Paris Accord. But average temperatures have already spiked more than a degree, fueling more extreme weather events worldwide. Current estimates say the planet could warm by more than three degrees by the end of the century. And just meeting existing pledges may not cut it. Here's the panel's chair, Ho Sang Lee. We are working when we should be sprinting. Nations are expected to update climate pledges by 2025. This latest assessment will serve as a guide. If there's any chance of making the necessary emissions cuts, the panel says, the world needs to transform agriculture and eating habits and speed up the transition to green energy. The warning comes while it estimates nearly half the planet's population is already vulnerable to climate impacts. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. As Ramadan approaches, people in Pakistani cities typically throng wholesale markets making bulk purchases of food and provisions for the holy month of fasting. This year, however, residents in Islamabad and Karachi are feeling the pinch of rising prices amid decades high inflation and a crippling economic slowdown. Germany's Minister of Education and Research visited Taiwan today, the first time a German minister had done so in 26 years to strengthen ties between the two countries. A rising court froze all Volkswagen assets in the country in the latest obstacle to the German car makers' year-long efforts to wind down its Russian operations. Amazon said that it would slash another 9,000 jobs to manage economic uncertainty. The cuts will be concentrated in Amazon's cloud services, advertising and Twitch units. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you with performers in colorful outfits marching through central Dublin in a parade to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.